This is Mac from 9B4 and the Family Adventures. And today we're in northern Namibia with the Himba tribe. Let me show you how we got here. After a three day self drive safari in Etosha National Park, where we witnessed the beauty of life in a harsh and rugged environment, we decided to head north into northwestern Namibia where we would find our next adventure. After several hours of traveling across the vast Namibian landscape, we finally made it to the regional capital of Apua. Morning, so we're in day four of our trip here in Namibia. We're up in the north in a town called Apua, and we're here to visit the Himba tribes. Now, we're gonna go up and see the tribes. We're heading out right now. It's about 7.30, 7.40 in the morning, and they, we have an 8 a.m. show time, and they're gonna take us up north, which is even further north, really close to the, uh, getting close to the Angolan border at that point. I have to kind of look up and down. It's kind of hilly, let me show you. While in Apua, we stayed at the Pua Country Lodge, mainly because they had a guide who could take us to visit the Himba tribe. This is a lot easier walk now than it was last night when we got in. It was already dark, so they let us down by light, flashlight, torch. And so uh, this is going pretty well. Again, we're going to visit the Himba tribes this morning. Really wanted to see this particular tribe because of their unique hair culture and different other cultural aspects. To truly understand why Blair and I traveled to Northern Namibia to visit the Himba tribe, we need to have a brief discussion about black hair and black hair culture. In my family, our hair is a representation of self and a clear personification of who we are as individuals. Throughout the years, Blair and I have worn multiple hairstyles, some of them long and some of them short, but all of them have been a personification of how we feel as individuals. The longer hairstyles take years to grow out and endless hours of styling to train your hair. But black hair is a central part of the black individual personality and perspective. And so it has carried over into our children as they grow out their own hair and start their own unique hair journeys. With hair playing such a central role in our family, of course we would seek out cultures that share a similar hair culture, such as the Himba. And so wanting to know more about their culture and about their hair, we traveled to Northern Namibia. The views from up here above the town of Apua are pretty nice. Apua has a population of about 20,000. After making our 8 a.m. showtime, we had a few minutes to rest before we met up with our guide. Our guide was a wonderful gentleman by the name of Ishmael. As a licensed and trained guide, Ishmael began to explain everything that we would need to know to interact with the Himba. One of the first things that Ishmael explained to us was that the money we paid for him as a guide also provided food for the Himba. For what you book for, is like uh, we buy food, we keep it at the lodge, a bag of rice meal, we call it uh, porridge, mm -hmm. and uh, that is now to give to the people for them to share. Drought-induced food insecurities are some of the main issues facing Namibia, especially the northwest region where the Himba tribe resides. Ishmael went on to explain that the more visitors that the region receives, the more food that is provided to the Himba tribe. In that case, we double. We gave like five bags of, of maize meal. After a 30-minute drive across the backcountry, we arrived at the Himba village of Inange. Home to an extended family, Inange housed about 40 people, including the village head chief and his four wives and all of their children. Ishmael went on to explain the village layout and the religious significance of all the buildings and their locations. This is a holy line. We call it the holy line. But we cannot cross here or here. Between the crowd and the holy fire, where they are sitting somewhere there, we cannot cross, but we can go around. Ishmael went on to explain that the day we were visiting the Himba was a religious holiday and that although we were welcome in the village, it would be disrespectful to get too close to the religious ceremonies taking place. Edmund's hut is here yeah. and there's the holy fire. Yeah, where they are sitting here. And we cannot cross in between cross, those two. Yeah. Absolutely. We just arrived at the Himba village. We just got a description of the village, of the layout. And we're at the head chief's family compound. And this is the family's goats. You guys know I like sheep, but I guess I like goats as well. Let's take a look at these family goats. As a semi-nomadic tribe, the Himba life cycle revolves around their livestock and their crops. Always in search of fresh pasture and water for their livestock, the Himba are extremely sensitive to drought conditions. This is the 
parts of the first one. As we arrived in the early morning, we found the Himba tribe just preparing breakfast. The headman's oldest son tried to have a conversation with me, but my Himba language skills are somewhat lacking. <laughs> The Hemba breakfast consists of a cornmeal porridge, and the corn is freshly ground every day. Mackie, he said sing while you do it. So what am I singing? I don't know, pick a song. Oh, to keep you awake. Is he better? Is he better than me? He's better than me. The Himba raise their own corn and set it out to dry on rooftops across the village. I wanted to speak with the elders today, the tribe's headsmen, but they're in the middle of a ceremony. Today is a special holiday, and it's a day to honor their ancestors, and they're, they're, they're honoring their ancestors right now, so we can't speak to any of them. The village headsmen and most of the other men in the village were involved in a religious ceremony, but we were able to meet with one of the village elders. <laughs> I noticed that each Himba man had a long stick with them. The, all the sticks looked similar, so I asked what was the purpose of the sticks? <laughs> I think what he says is a, is a culture. A man, every Himba man or a herero, you have to get a. If you are an old man, it's like you have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, tell you to. Uh, <laughs> also, it's like it's waking, like when he stood up, or when he was like sitting, you have to get a stick. To help in that, or that mm -hmm. and okay. uh, also for it's, a, it's quite like a, it's a culture. Every Himba man. Mm -hmm. What are you eating? Oh, that's bad anyway. Playing this little guy's been following me around because I have these. Here you go. After a great meeting with the elders of the village, we decided to spend some time with the children. And although we could speak the same language as the children, sugar-free candy is a universal kid language. After meeting with the children and some of the elders, we moved on to meet with the women of the village. And this is where you get to a lot of the cultural aspects about the Hemba that is more renowned. Hemba women cover their hair and bodies in a red mixture of butter, animal fat, and a red ochre, which is a red stone pigment. The stone is ground to a powder and then mixed with the other ingredients.
After grinding, the stone is then added to the butter and animal fat, which is then applied to the skin. The application of the oka mixture provides some protection from the sun and insects, but it's primarily a beautification ritual that conveys age and status amongst the tribe. Applied to the body, the mixture is also applied to the hair. The renowned red braids of the Hemba women are created by the same mixture, but out of a thicker consistency and then shaped around the individual braids. To start the process, the hair is braided with extensions. With the ends left loose, the braided section is then coated with the ochre mixture. To do the hairstyle from the top down to the last part, it takes about a week long. Here you can see a Hemba grandmother in the process of getting her hair recoated. The process is repeated about every three weeks. Hemba women do not bathe with water, but rather they burn a mixture of herbs. Using the smoke from the herbs, they purify their bodies. The herbal mixture is made of plants that grow abundantly in the area. Once applied via the smoke, the Hemba women have a smell that blends in perfectly with their natural environment. The smoke is used to perfume the body as well as the hair. So we finished up our time here with the Himba tribe and at the end they set up a little market where they bring out some things that they've made. And I think Blair and I got a little carried away. We picked up a lot because we recognize we may not be back here again. And we also want to show our gratitude for the tribe for taking their time and spending some time with us today and this morning and letting us experience their life for a little while. And they spent time making these items. So we purchased a few. So now we're gonna negotiate prices. <laughs> with a true appreciation for the Himba and their culture, Blair and I purchased as many items as we possibly could. There are not many cultures like the Himba left in the world, tribes and people out of step with the modern society. These cultures are consistently at risk from climate change, drought, and most especially modernization. So join us on our next video as we visit a Himba school and see how the Himba tribe is preparing the next generation. <laughs> And together with the help of the community.